Hello everybody, welcome back to How to Harad, sort of a mix of a guide slash let's play for the Empire of Harad in the Fourth Age Total War Dominion of Men. Now, in this episode, we are going to bask in the glory of our secured frontiers. I want you to take a look here at our eastern border. Uh, in the last episode, of course, we got Far Harad as our protectorate. That's this faction here. And in between episodes, I did give them this settlement. This is Alec Rokbin. It's a settlement that in the previous episode we did capture and even defended for a little while against Khan. But it's much more important that this front cease to be a concern for us. And we can do that by basically walling this entire thing off so that no other factions can access us. Our protectorate, Far Harad, is not going to be hostile to us. They will never break the protectorate state outright. What they will do at best is if we happen to uh, share an ally and that ally attacks me, then Far Harad may side with the ally. But we can avoid that scenario in most cases. And so I'm very happy to just completely leave them to guard the frontier. If we look at the diplomacy, we can see that uh, Far Harad is not currently at war with anyone apart from just the rebels. And so this is going to have a further effect since we're not going to be bordering Khand and Khand is not at war with our ally Far Harad, it's very likely that we'll be able to get a ceasefire with Khand in the next episode or in the next turn or two. And if that is the case, we can probably even get some nice tribute from them for the privilege. So this means that all these armies that we've spent uh, all these turns fighting in Khand, fighting in the south and in the east against Far Harad, all these armies can now be turned elsewhere. We may want to leave some presence here along the frontier just in case things go wrong or just in case maybe we want to go and balance things out somewhere in the north of this uh, general region. But we will not need like the four stacks we have. Uh, just to recap, we have the capital city of Far Harad as one of those frontier settlements that borders, again, our protectorate. And here is where we're going to eventually get some very nice Far Harad style units, such as these men of Far Harad. Uh, even Horsemen of the Harnan are, can be got here and Archers of Harad. So some very good stuff overall there. Karis Agar is going to be more of our administrative capital. It's got some decent production capability. Uh, in terms of military, we can get some basic things like Swords of Harad and the Red Sand Archers, very cost-effective, and Herodwaith Riders. But it's not going to be our military center because we, of course, have this uh, as one of those places. We also have Karenbad where we can train a wide variety of units. And we also have Partreb to the north at tier one is giving us Partreb tribesmen. So some very interesting and mostly ranged units, which are going to be really effective against anything that we might want to fight over here. So we've got the east basically locked down. It's time then to take a look at what we're going to do now that we've essentially walled ourselves off with protectorates. Now, one school of thought would say just go for Gondor, just attack them right off the bat. You've got fleets, you've got military superiority in the region. You could just go for your victory conditions. What we need to do ultimately to win the game is to take uh, Dol Amroth, Minus Anor, Lin here, and Pelargir. So basically, all these important coastal settlements in Gondor. And that's certainly something that we will do, but I find it a lot more fun to try these more outlandish things, to try something a little more uh, a little more interesting. And so what we did in the last episode was sailed a fleet north and disembarked a full stack here just south of the Aizen River. We are going to march this east today and we're going to try to disrupt Rohan and the Reunited Kingdom's operations in Dunland. We are not allied with Dunland yet. We don't have any diplomatic relationships with them, but I aim to change that in this episode and we'll see if we can get ourselves into an interesting position around here. All right, let's first move our spy around. I know there's this fort here with a very tiny force but I also know there's a settlement right over there, Arendal. Okay. Pretty straightforward so far. I'm not seeing any large forces of the Reunited Kingdom. They have managed to hold on to Dunfreca, so it looks like they're not going to lose that to a rebellion anytime soon, which is just fine. I'd rather fight a small Reunited Kingdom garrison than a large rebel garrison, which can be fairly strong. And it looks like Dunland may do a little bit of counterattacking uh, on their own volition here. 
I, I'm a bit torn about this. I don't want them to do too well. I would not like Dunlin to be conquering into Rohan necessarily, but I also am glad that they haven't lost a bunch of territory to Rohan already. Kind of what you want typically in, in uh, Total War campaigns is a pretty even balance of power between your allies and your enemies. You want them to be c keeping each other busy, uh, but not getting too strong. Okay, it looks like there was some kind of battle here, but fairly inconclusive. Dunland uh, is not completely kicked out of the area, but they do not have that large stack anymore. Let's move the spy up here. They've got plenty of stacks, though, so they could certainly um, they could certainly come back and, and do some more damage to Rohan. So let's move our own army again. We've got a pretty clear road, it looks like. There certainly may be some, uh, some armies marching around or hiding in the woods here. But, no, so far it looks fine. I'm going to leave Arendal for the moment. I don't necessarily want to take it just yet. I think I want to go straight for Dunfreca because I want to make sure I get there before Dunlin does. And in terms of our income, I mean, just take a look at this. We're doing quite well, uh, making almost 17000 a turn. Uh, that's in part uh, due to, of course, our protectorates. Uh, but also it's just due to the very secure position that uh, Harad has. So we've got basically uh, no enemy neighbors. We're trading with everyone who we border. And we do have access to sea trade. So we're trading with our own cities. Um, and that's certainly helping things out quite a bit. But we could make even more money here. So let's see if we can uh, get peace with Khand. We've got a pretty decent emissary here. I'm not sure exactly how that translates into into success in terms of diplomatic negotiation. I believe it simply makes bribes cost less, but I'm not totally sure. So we'll see. Since we don't share a border anymore, uh, how about a ceasefire and how about asking for some cash? We'll try 10,000. All right, they'll give half it. You know what? We'll take it. So we've got a ceasefire with them now. What I could do then at this point, I do see that they have some armies in the territory of my protectorate here, my vassal, Far Harad. This is a little troublesome. Uh, I certainly don't want Khand to retake this territory, but they may want it back very badly because they have uh, victory conditions, which include taking and holding all of their own territory. So they're going to need to get this settlement back if they want to win. I think Khand also needs to take Athen Karis as well. I could be wrong about that. Uh, but they do tend to like to get these other couple of settlements also. So it almost wouldn't surprise me if they started a war with my vassal. But we'll see what they do. I'm going to give them a few turns. I don't want to ally with them just yet, although they might be open to it. What I'd like to do instead is see if I can get an alliance with a Dunabar. I don't know if we have any emissaries in the area. Okay, here we have an emissary right outside of Athrad Morn. He's got a couple of crowns of authority. We'll see if now that we're not at war with Khand, now we can indeed go for an alliance with a Dunabar. Let's see if they would be willing to give that up. And I'm going to ask for map information. I'm just curious to see how they're doing. All right, they want trade and they want a bunch of cash. Um, let's cancel all of that then and just go for a straight up alliance. Okay, so they're happy with that now. And what this means is, if we have to go to war with Khand, we stand a very good chance of stripping them of their ally, uh, Adunabar. So let's see what Khand is, is uh, sitting at the moment. They've got these two allies, one of which is Rune. So I think in the next turn, I'm going to try to remember to ask Rune for an alliance as well. There shouldn't be any barriers to that, uh, although Rune is allied with Rohan. Okay, so that is going to be a problem. Uh, but we can at least strip Khand of its alliance with Adunabar. And since we're now allied with Adunabar, Dunland may be more open to alliance with us as well. Let's see if they've changed their tune. And they're happy to do it. Before, they were uh, very hesitant to, uh, to give us an alliance. And this, I suspect, is because I was at war with Khand, who was an ally of Adunabar, who was an allied... Uh, who was an ally of Dunland. I'm not sure if the AI takes in all of those things into consideration, but it does seem to form these uh, diplomatic blocks or coalitions. So it may be the case. But now we've cleared that up. We've got a couple of, of alliances now, in addition to our overlordships. And the advantage to having alliances, there actually is a benefit to it in this mod. Um, the benefit stems from your faction leader's authority stat. Uh, the authority of your faction leader, let me find mine. 
Ah, yes, he's currently governing Karenbad, a very important settlement in the center of our realm here. Uh, Fuinir of Central Herodwaith, who took over when his, uh, his father died of old age, is now the Emperor of Harad, and his authority is sitting rather pretty at 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. Uh, so you can see that there are, uh, there's a fairly extensive tooltip here. It says, uh, in terms of the ruler, this ruler can count on the support of many powerful men in his realm. Now, this authority can get up as high as 10, and if it does, there are a few benefits that accrue. Part of the benefit is simply that the authority is the influence stat from Rome Total War, and as such, it, it affects things such as public order in the settlement that the, uh, that the faction leader is governing, as well as the bodyguard size, I believe. If we were to take a look at the men he has, yeah, 42, that's pretty significant. So getting more authority would even increase that number higher. However, in some ways, more importantly, authority has an impact on the opinion of liege trait of all of your other family members. This is the trait that, if we find another family member here, it's located right underneath the this triad of, you know, lazy, intelligent, uncharismatic. And currently, uh, for this character, Nabulung of Adabara, he is supportive. That's how he's feeling about his faction leader. It's kind of a middle of the road. There's not really... Um, uh, not really too much benefit here, but at least there's no penalties. You can go quite high, though, in your opinion of liege, and you can get big bonuses to trade income, income tax collection, troop morale, and so on, uh, by increasing this opinion of liege trait. One way to increase that opinion of liege trait is to ensure that your faction leader has a high authority. So you always want to be pumping this stat up. And one way to pump that up is by conquering territory, Another way is to increase your alliances. Make sure you're not fighting a ton of wars and make sure that you do have a lot of allies. So we're ending some wars currently. We're gaining some allies. We'll see how this plays into his authority in a little bit. And unfortunately, we do have war here. As you can see, Khan has attacked Far Harad. I guess we're not getting out of the east quite as quickly as I thought we would. So let's try this. Now that we've got you know a bunch of armies right here, this is going to be pretty straightforward to deal with. Let's attack this army and see what happens to the diplomacy. We already got a bunch of money out of Khan. We'll go ahead and fight this. I'm assuming they're probably going to withdraw from the battlefield, so it's probably not worth showing. Well, I stand corrected. They seem to want to fight. Let's just charge in. Now, I know they do have uh, quite a few archers here, so that is going to be a problem for the Mumikil, potentially, but we are going to be working on training our own. So we'll just go right after those archers of Khan. We've got our bodyguards uh, coming in as well. Very good, they're routing already. This dragon guard are not shying away either. But I don't think they're any match for our Mumikil. We've got them down quite a bit already. And there they go, deciding to flee. We'll see if we can catch him on the way out here. And you can see what I mean, these Mumikil are having no trouble catching up to this unit. The question is though, can they kill him before he crosses the invisible line? And it looks like they're not going to. He's going to get away, which is unfortunate. But the main thing is we have protected our protectorate. We've kept the trade routes open between our two settlements. Uh, if this was under siege for a long time, that trade of course would be drying up. And uh, now we've got a new sense of purpose in the area. We will have to move rather quickly to prevent 
con from taking some of these unwalled settlements, so it might be worth giving a bit of cash to Far Harad as well, just to speed things along. Now, my armies haven't gotten too far away, so we can just turn them right back around here and get them all headed right back to face Khand yet again. This is, I admit, a little unexpected. In my prior experience, the AI tends to kind of disregard vassalized factions. So, in other words, if you make a faction your protectorate, a lot of times the AI seems to kind of leave it hands off. This may be an exception because Far Harad owns a lot of territories that are important to Khand, so their, uh, their desire to get those places back is going to override their hesitance about attacking a vassal. Uh, but at any rate, this is certainly nothing we can't handle. It does also offer us an additional opportunity, potentially. We can see about taking another settlement off of them. I did have my eyes on this one, and maybe leaving them with these two to, uh, to become another protectorate for us. We'll see how things unfold. But at the moment, unfortunately, I don't think we can get Rune to be our ally, at least as things currently stand. You see, the, op the option is not there. In the meantime, we can keep approaching Dunfreca, some more forested terrain here. Great position for an ambush, particularly at that ford. But no reunited kingdom forces at all. We are in territory for some mercenaries now. Uh, these are rather useful. Dunlanding mercenaries are uh, pretty low upkeep, although they don't have that many men per unit, so the cost effectiveness is you know, somewhat questionable, I guess. Uh, the main thing for me is that they have a bit of a hybrid ability to them. They do have a decent missile attack, some you know, okay defense, a little bit of a melee attack, and they're really good, you know, for garrison, for a wall duty, that type of thing. Uh, we're not going to pick any up here just yet, but we certainly could. We could split up our forces uh, to make room for those mercs. I just don't think it's reasonable to do that at this point. But if we end up taking Dunfreca soon, we'll definitely buy all the mercs we can get. All right, and we'll take care to scout out our approach to Dunfreca. There's certainly maybe some troops hiding in the woods. But I guess not. So what I like to do around here is try to get the high ground if possible. We can move up there and then put the settlement under siege. Build a few rams and see what they have inside. Oh, some pretty formidable stuff actually. Uh, so we've got some King Spearmen, a couple of Dol Amroth men at arms, a very solid cavalry unit, as well as some longbow men and some regular archers, uh, and a family member to top it all off. So we know that they do have some uh, reinforcements potentially coming from the west. We're not sure if Rohan is going to want to get in on this fight. Uh, so it'll be interesting to see what the AI does in response to this move. Well, aside from moving some of their fleets around, it seems like there's been no response from the United Kingdom or from Rohan. Uh, so we're pretty much free to take this if we want. Uh, we can certainly assault it. I'm noticing there's no Dunlending forces around here, so always good to get a spy out and around, and it looks like they have no trouble holding their own. Maybe, though, we can see what Rohan has in the works. Let's see, they do have some forces approaching here, although it's largely infantry. Some good stuff, though. Shields of the Mark are pretty decent. Looks like these are the remnants of their guards of the King's House, so nothing too terrifying there. And we can't really see beyond this point. So I think rather than let this siege run out, we may want to be aggressive here. The sooner we get this done, the sooner we can start rebuilding it and making it useful for us. All right, so Dunfreca is, you know, decently defended by some walls that archers can get up on. But the archers in this case have decided to go way over here, possibly... Uh, outsmarting itself a little bit. The AI has seen the mass of my forces over here and figured that uh, this is the best best position for their longbows. And actually, this does command a, a useful route that I was planning on taking up here. But seeing that, I think I'll just change up my plan slightly and we'll just come through the, the front gate, basically. Uh, we've got the heavy cav stationed up here, some Dol Amroth men-at-arms, a couple of understrength units, and the bodyguard as well. And there's some towers in the area, as well as, you know, this unit of King Spearmen. I think we should be able to deal with all of that, uh, given what we have. Uh, on this end of the walls, we've got, I guess it's three units of swords, well, four if you count this guy. Four red sand archers and some swording skirmishers. The javelins here are going to do a decent amount of work, although we are going to kind of play chicken with these guys. Let's, let's go ahead and see if we can take out a few of them just with spears. And if that makes them move a little bit, because I'd love to capture this gatehouse, of course. Alright, so they do have a couple. Now, if they were to move over here, 
I would bring my other men over because we've got some spearmen of the serpent ready to go through these gates. And I was, again, originally planning on taking them up uh, over here. But the archers are covering that route, so maybe now we'll just head here, take out the cav, get up to the town square, and uh, sit for a little while. All right, so we get holes at all the uh, all the wall openings now, and we've got our javelins doing a bit of damage on these guys. Just one volley is taken out, what, four or five? That, that's pretty impressive, and that's, you know, that's why these Swords of Harad have such a, such a wicked reputation uh, among fans of the mod. And so, given that they're just going to contest this gap with spearmen, um, although they may bring these cav over to support, either way, that's going to allow us an opportunity to sneak up here with some swords and capture a tower. We'll see what they do, because either they're going to bring those cav over or these cav, and I kind of like my odds. So we'll bring our, uh, bring our archers forward so they can start getting in on it. Right, we officially own the gateway. I don't think we need to be up here anymore, so we'll come down to help out our fellow swordsmen fighting the bodyguard. We're evenly matched, and, you know, swords are not obviously a favored uh, unit to fight Cav, but they're going to do okay just given their numbers as long as they're not scared away. Oh, and here we go. <laughs> this may be the end of them. We are bringing in support through this opening. So I think, I think we'll be able to, to do fairly well, regardless. We want to be a little careful here because this is all of our force in Rohan at the moment. But at the same time, we've got to we've got to get this. All right, the archers are coming down and let's uh Let's see. I think I think I want to scramble some cab over there. If we can get them before they get to the town plaza, that's just going to make life a lot easier. We are going to lose cab to the towers, no question. Hopefully they'll come over to us. I really don't want them getting a nice strong position up at the top. Oh, great. We've got the general down. Alright, so now we run everybody to the top of the plaza. And, you know, I think... I don't know if it makes sense to have a uh, have a bodyguard. Let's, let's pull the cav back because we want to get all the cav together. I don't know why this guy's not coming. Oh, he was... He was commanded to go up here for some reason. Very, very strange. All right, this is tricky because it's a cav charge in a city, so and and we're under fire from a couple of different towers. At least we can tie these guys up. All right, so we'll wait. It says they're idle. Okay, looks like they're not moving. And let's do a charge, see how it works. And they're charging in, too. You have to give the uh, Longwoman credit. I mean, they are a very, very tough unit. Not afraid to get into melee. And we're at about even numbers here. They're winning easily. Yeah, they're going to beat me. Now, part of it is we're under fire from the towers, but a lot of that's just the Longbowmen. They are that good. Uh, those towers, yeah, they're doing a little bit of damage. Um... But we would have been hurt regardless. So, if those longbows are going to continue to follow us, that's great. Because we've got some other infantry here. And we can just pull them right out. And I'm sure my swords will be able to deal with that. We can use our bodyguards up here to pull out these militia or Dol Amroth men-at-arms. And we've got actual archers too. 
All right, and it looks like the longbowmen have decided to head up the safer route for them. So we're pulling out these guys, getting them to rout. But what we really want to do is take out the men-at-arms of Dol Amroth. And unfortunately, these Kingdom Militia are going to get back to the plaza mostly intact. But let's hit these men-at-arms with our bodyguard. We should be good here. We're going to take a bit of friendly fire. All right, wavering swarm tactics with Harad work, work fairly well. All right, and that's the end of that unit. Let's just charge in and capture the plaza here. I want to be in a position to just be able to run down those longbowmen uh, and these other militia, I think they are, as they come up the hill. All right, well, and actually that's the end of them, so we'll, we'll do that. Head straight ahead, and let's get our own bowmen into the square. Not that we'll need it. So I think what's going to happen is we're, we're going to uh, get these guys to both rout. Remember, our bodyguards have that fear effect. Oh, and this is just a regular archer unit. Even better. Now, the charge that we did with our uh, Horsemen of the Harnan uh, was, I think, a good charge. You know, it's difficult to pull off a decent charge in the city. Like, now we're not actually charging. Okay, we, we did right at the end there. But I think the one we pulled off earlier was actually better. It's just that um, the longbowmen had more men in the unit at the time, and you know their army was intact at that moment. All right, let's just pull through. All right, we've got some backup coming uh, this way. Apparently, they'll be uh, they'll be gone pretty quick. And there's the end of the unit. All right, so we'll just end the battle. And there goes Dunfreca. Excellent. This is not very happy with us, so we have basically no option but to lay desolate here. And we're going to lower the taxes, and even that is not going to be enough. Let's, um, let's see what the problem is. I think we've got a bunch of unrest here. We've got a, an, an alignment problem, of course. We do have our full garrison, so it's not a public order, uh, or it's, it's, it's not a numbers issue. Even if the population shrinks, this is not, it's not really going to help. Um, so I think we may have a spy in there that's hostile to us. We'll just try to stick it out. Now, the other thing we can try is to get rid of the uh, current governor uh, and see if the other guy does better. Yes, he does. So this guy had some bad traits, and when he's serving as the governor, it's not doing anything good. So maybe what we'll do is we'll bring him up here. He's going to be in an ambush position here, um, which is fine. We'll go ahead and, uh, and grab some mercenaries, and he can just hang out here in the woods and do that. Now, in terms of what we have left, it's not a lot. I think I'm uh, kind of obligated at this point to chuck my spy into the city to root out any other enemy agents. And before we lose the population completely, I'll queue up a couple of agents for us. I think it also makes sense to rebuild the stockade. And, you know, since, uh, yeah, I think we had to do that. Get rid of the Outland Dominion, start working on pacification. Um, I'll keep the consultation because we can build off of this. Uh, but everything else, I think we will retain. Now, the interesting thing about this settlement it is, is that it is a Dunlanding uh, settlement, but the reunited kingdom has gotten in and built some stuff. So they've got this yard of fountains, which otherwise uh, we would not have found here. Now, that's not helping the, uh, the culture penalty anyway, but let's take a look at what we could get. So interestingly, very interestingly here, um, this is actually a not an outland for us. It's not a homeland, but it is a fiefdom. Dunland is considered a fiefdom for Harad, apparently. And so that means we're going to get a lot of our native units. So at the first couple of tiers, uh, we're going to get just Dunlandish Spearman Levies, which is actually a, a very solid uh, garrison unit. They've got throwing spears, and so that complements our usual style of keeping on fire at will and just chucking things at the enemy. Uh, so it goes really nice with our swords. 
Um, I don't know. Okay, they do have a bonus versus riders, so they're good in that capacity, which is great against Rohan. But the real draw for this unit is just a massive amount of men with throwing spears. Uh, so there's a lot of them there and extremely low upkeep. So fantastic garrison unit. And then at the second tier, we get Rohan Spear Levies. This is a shieldless cavalry unit. It is essentially uh, basically built for a charge and nothing else. So they're going to die and they do have a fairly high upkeep, uh, but they're cav. So tier two cav, it's kind of hard to argue with that. Uh, we will also at tier two get some native units already. So we're going to get footmen of Harad. If we want to spend our 90 upkeep on something other than spear throwers, we can have a few more spear shovers, I guess, and uh, plainsmen skirmishers. I think we'll probably pass on these guys because the local uh, mercenaries we can have are kind of skirmishers. Um, although they are more expensive, I think they're a little more robust. They get a shield, a bit better melee. Uh, so that's tier two. Tier three, we start to get our Swords of Harad and our Harad Waith Riders. In tier four, we can get Spearmen of the Serpent, Archers of Harad, and even Horsemen of the Harden. So we get a lot, a lot of local stuff or native stuff here all the way up in Dunland. So it's a very interesting um, and, and sort of surprising uh, flexibility you have. So I think we will definitely keep this. And the other great thing is because Dunfreck is a chief city, we can build all of that military stuff without neglecting the other happiness, trade, uh, economy buildings. So we get a lot to go on. So on the AI's turn, uh, we can see that unfortunately, Khand has taken one of our border provinces. They've taken Elagos from Far Harad. Now we could fight to get this back. We've got an army right here, so we could go for that immediately. Um, on the other hand, we've got so much money, let's use it. Let's take our diplomat over here and we'll see if we can bring an end to this war. All right, we'll give you 6,000 Mirian. Give us back that settlement you just took from our ally, and they'll take it. Step two, of course, we don't want Elagos, so we'll gift it to Far Harad. And as always, I like to attach a little bit of money to those gifted settlement offers. They accept. And now we're back in business. Now, Khand could certainly take this again. They could just march the army right back there. Uh, but what we're going to do is get these guys um, out of the area. We'll get we'll get these Haradrian peasants at arms and use them for garrison or something. Maybe we'll put them in a fort. Uh, but what I think I'll do, just so that Khand you know, doesn't keep doing this, is I'll take these armies and I'm going to march them into Khand's territory. I want to be in a position to take their capital and I think that'll be a way to kind of bring this annoyance to an end. We'll do it with a combination of diplomacy, kind of throwing money at the problem. And since we're neutral to them, I don't think we'll be attacked and we don't share a border with them. So anything we do militarily to kind of pressure them a little bit in addition to our diplomacy is going to have a much better chance of working. If in the end I end up with their capital and leave them with uh, this buffer to the north and this settlement right here, which we can't see yet, uh, then I'd be happy with that. And Dunfreca is looking a lot happier too. I've moved my capital to Harn Gond, which is the sort of the central province in Harandor from Akas Anabon. So that puts things a little closer to where they are. It costs us overall a couple of thousand in terms of uh, you know yearly income, but we can well afford that at this point. And I think it's well worth the cost to keep this settlement happy. Sending our spy into the west, it doesn't look like there's any inclination on the part of the reunited kingdom to try to take this back. So excellent news, we'll just sit tight and build. And in the south, I do have another army that I am working on sending north just as a reinforcement here so we can continue our, well, continue our shenanigans in the region. All right, this is very interesting. Rohan is approaching us with a ceasefire offer. Now, the very funny thing about this is that this is not going to last because they have a strong alliance with the reunited kingdom. So if they get a ceasefire with me uh, next turn, I believe they're going to follow the reunited kingdom back into war with me. So the only way we could really get peace with either one of those factions is by getting simultaneous peace with both. That's fairly unlikely. It is possible. Um, but what you could do now is you could try to cheese it a little bit and say, okay, well, you want a ceasefire. How about you give me a province, right? Let's try just some... Uh, something ridiculous like give me the Hornburg and we'll have a ceasefire. They're, they're, they're not going to take it. They say it's too generous. Sure it is. Yeah, so I don't really like the fact that 
Khan is still sniffing around the area here, and what's more, they have put Erlag Rokbin under siege. I think I have no other choice but to get involved with them again in a war, so let's take our spy, and we'll send him around to see what forces they might have in the area. I don't think there's many, actually. Yeah, Lug is basically undefended. They do have another settlement to the north, Muldin, but it's it's basically nothing. So I think what we'll do is we'll go ahead and put a Karn under siege. Uh, we've got a decent army here. We could just, we could probably take it. Now for Dunfreca, we've just finished our provincial pacification so we can get going on our fiefdom dominion. That's going to take us only seven turns, and uh, we'll have you know a decent amount of land tax for it. Now, we're so far from our capital that we're losing about 800 in just mismanagement, but still, it's a necessary prerequisite. Now, I'm wondering if we could try for a ceasefire with Rohan and get something slightly different. Like, let's say you give me the fort of Dul Baran. I don't necessarily want this, but I'm curious to see if it would work. <laughs> They'll give it to us, all right. This is arguably a terrible move. Uh, a, because the, the public order is just very low. Uh, but B, more importantly, this th you never want to do something like this, right? Dunland clearly wants this. Uh, they are my ally at the moment, but I think they need it for victory, so they're going to try to take it back. Uh, Rohan wants it, so they're going to try to take it back. It's just a bad move to interpose yourself in between two factions that are at war and have no other way to attack each other, because probably what's going to happen is they'll make peace and they'll both start attacking me. But I was just curious to see if it was possible. And if I had asked maybe for, oh, there's a fort down here, uh, Dunharrow, they probably would have given me that instead, um, which is which is pretty entertaining. Unfortunately, they don't want to give up the Hornburg. That's okay. I'll get it by hook or by crook. Now, this outpost here, again, we're probably not going to keep. Um, it does offer some nice trade, though, actually, for just a fort. Yeah, 614, and I'm not technically trading, I think, with anybody. Let's check uh, what we're doing with Dunland. They are an ally. We do not have any trade with them currently, so let's, you know what, let's go with that. Let's see if we can get some trade happening. And I believe that that's, that's only going to encourage them to be hostile to us. So you can see trade rights there increases it to 835 from 614. So another couple hundred for doing basically nothing. Uh, some of that's going to be eaten up. Oh yeah, uh, almost 60 or so by uh, just corruption. But at any rate, we do have some buildings and infrastructure in place. Now we'll want to destroy this building. This is Captain's Feasts. And at the forts, you do have a very limited building tree. Uh, these are not intended to be full settlements, but you can do things like garrison farming to get a little bit of population growth and get it to a point where eventually, after you know two or three more buildings, you can start to train some very, very basic garrison-type units. I think for this fort, they're going to be essentially the Dunlanding Spearmen type. Uh, but it varies depending on where the fort is located. So it gives you just a little bit of uh, versatility there. Now, it might not be worth doing this here because we're, we're probably going to lose it in a couple of turns. Although, I could maybe get some men up here and, uh, and garrison it, but I'm thinking that's probably not likely. In any case, we'll see what happens here. If it goes rebel, that'll be just entertaining. All right, we do have a battle to fight here. This is for Akarn. We're being attacked by... A bunch of horse archers for the most part, almost entirely cavalry. And uh, in the city, we have the heir of the faction of Khand, Lore of Akarn, with his unit of Dragon Guard, as well as a couple foot archers. So it'll be, uh, it'll be a fun battle. I don't think it'll be too challenging for us. All right, so yeah, there's the reinforcing army. I think what we'll do with that is send the, the elephants and all of this cavalry uh, right at it. The other elements of the army are racing for the hill, and this is mostly foot archers. We do have our Swords of Harad. Uh, the front line for this, we've got our Parcharab tribesmen. And these are going to be a really good unit for this position uh, because they have those two-handed spears as a melee weapon. So I'm actually taking them right off uh, skirmish mode. May not be a wise idea, but I figure... It might make sense to let them get into melee in case any of these very light horse units feel like charging us. Uh, down here we are 
fighting very poorly because I've not been paying attention. But I think actually we're going to do okay. Just charge in with all of our cataphracts. Elephants are causing absolute chaos. There goes the enemy air. Now we're going to bring the Moomikill around only for the purpose of chasing down routers. We're going to bring the other cab as well. And I guess at this point we may as well bring all the cavalry. Because we've done all the damage we can do really. So now the question is, is this army going to stick around or are they going to withdraw? Because they have, uh, you know, seen that the garrison army has been defeated. Right, it looks like we are being probed on this wing. We've got our spears out. Now, we are taking a massive loss here. But we're holding them up at least. There goes the enemy general. We did not rout. I'm actually very surprised there. All right, you guys hold up. One of the challenges with these switch hitter units is that there is a bit of uh, clunkiness when it comes to actually doing the switching. When these units go from bow to melee, it, it doesn't happen instantly. And so, as you saw there, when they got charged, a lot of them still had bows out. Whereas if they had uh, used up all of their ammunition, then they would have been in a position to just stand braced and, uh, and, and do a lot better. As it is, these guys have a lot of arrows, and I mean, that's that's a good thing. The other thing you can do if you want them to operate sensibly in sort of a melee mode is actually take them off fire at will and then give them manual attack orders. All right, at this point, I think we've got this all set, though. We've got, again, our swords, javelins uh, right behind. We've got further dedicated archers in the back. Chase these guys down and see what happens to a Karn. Well, that's what happened to a Karn. We took it. We've laid it desolate. It is now ours. Uh, I'm not sure if we're going to be able to hold it. Let's see. We can get it down to 60%. This may be one that we either gift or let rebel. I'm honestly not sure. Um, we can see that, again, Khan has taken Alagos. But I think at this point, I could do the same trick that we just used. Uh, gift it back to Far Harad and then we'd be totally fine. You can see they're already pulling away from Allied Rope Bin. I think what I might try to do is, is hold on to this. We're at 60%. Maybe taking out the family member is going to be a good thing. Now, interestingly, we're showing the wonder bonus. That's because we have that fort, um, the, the, the Tree Garth of Orthanc. That does still give us a wonder bonus, which is going to be a temporary uh, public order boost pretty much everywhere. So what we can certainly do here is trash it and just absolutely uh, wreck Khan's day. But let's see if we have any chance of holding it. Let's get rid of this governor, see if anyone does any better. That's worse, 55. Okay, here we go. We may have found a winner here. Surur or Akas Anabon. Uh, he is, let's see, a plainsman doesn't give him any bonuses to happiness. But I'm not, I'm not sure what it is, but he's at least not as bad as the others. So yes, I think we've found our new northeastern outpost. I'm going to hold this. Uh, Khand is not such a deadly enemy that I'm that worried that they're going to be able to take it back. And if they do, it's just an outpost, right? That, that It's not really integral to our defenses. It'll be most useful for us to retain this border um, and to retain our protectorate because I really don't want Khand messing that up. So speaking of, let's deal with that. I'm going to offer them a hefty 10,000. Oh, they're going to deny it. Well, that's unfortunate. So what we have to do now is really make sure that Far Harad doesn't get into any trouble. Um, I think what we'll do is maybe we'll use this army, and we'll, we may have to take this back manually, or we'll try it diplomatically on a following turn. Uh, the other thing we can do, though, is potentially think about getting these guys as a protectorate, Khand, that is. Uh, we can at least bottle them up. And then if we could get them as a protectorate, that would be very entertaining. We would have the entire east locked down. And yes, rather predictably, Rohan has declared war on us. I guess it's better than Dunlin doing it. You know, if they want to take the, this fort back, I'm totally fine for them to do so. I'm not even going to bother to play it out if they assault. We've just got peasants. 
Oh, we do have an army coming to attack us at Dunfrecca. Reunited Kingdom has assembled some forces. Let's see what they are. And it's a lot of lowish tier stuff. Interesting units here. They do have some King Spearmen, but I am glad to see they brought the Blackroot Veil Bowmen. Very thematic and appropriate uh, because, of course, they are from, well, right over here, right? The Blackroot Veil. Morthon Veil. So this is a, that's a great unit to see. It's always cool to have them out in the west of Gondor. Uh, but I don't think they're going to do too well here. We've got plenty of archers of our own. Uh, we've got four red sand archers and three archers of Harad, as well as some scary skirmishers, a bunch of swordsmen with spears. And we do have this backup mercenary army just in case we need it, but I don't think we will. Uh, I'm more worried about, you know, the swordsmen infantry. They could shrug off a lot of those arrows and, you know, do some damage. But I think we'll be all right for this one. Oh, and interestingly, Dunland and Tharbad are at war. That's that's actually great news. It means our ally Dunland is now concerned with heading north rather than deciding to attack us. All right, let's try one more time to get Alagos back diplomatically. Give them 7,000, and they're going to say no. I wonder if that's because uh, we've taken their capital and they just don't want to deal with us anymore. It could be the case. Never fear, we have some armies on the way. We can take this back pretty easily. And it doesn't look like Khand is uh, is very concerned with taking out Far Harad anymore now that we've certainly caused a problem for them up north. So yes, the goal now will be to destroy these armies of Khand that are in the field. We'll take out these armies probably off screen. These are going to be very, very minor battles. And then we'll move our armies into position to put Alagos under siege, to put Lug under siege, to take out this force and to put their last remaining settlement, their new capital, Muldin, under siege as well. And then we'll just give them some time to think about what they've done. We'll definitely take Alagos and gift it back to Far Harad. Hopefully by bottling up Khand, we will have given Far Harad enough time to like build walls in its towns. And maybe we'll offer them a bit of cash as well uh, to accelerate that process. Uh, but we are more involved in the east than I anticipated. But in the west, that's certainly where the action is going to happen. In the next episode, folks, we will see if we can hold on to Dunfrecca in the face of the Reunited Kingdom's assault, see what happens to Dol Boran, and see if we can make any progress here in the north. So look forward to seeing you next time. Take care until then.